give that just a moment to catch up. Get that going on YouTube. All right, I heard my own voice, so that's good. I'm gonna close out of here. All right, hello everyone, and welcome again to yet another show of Wit and Wisdom with Dr. Keith Witt. My name is Corey DeVos, and uh, yeah, we've got we've got a, a cool conversation in store for you guys. Um, first off, Dr. Keith, how you doing, man? I am doing quite well today. It's a beautiful day in Santa Barbara, though it's blustery. Makes me think of the Winnie the Pooh video, Winnie the Pooh <laughs> on the blustery day. How are you doing? How are you doing in Boulder? I'm doing great, man. It's a little bit chilly outside. Um, I missed you because we didn't do our show last month. Uh, mm -hmm. We had some we had some sort of last minute issues come up, um, but I'm psyched to be here with you today, and I'm and I'm psyched for you know the conversation that you uh, pitched for the day. Uh, and, and I have to admit, it was a little um, there, there's a lot to unpack in what you sent along. <laughs> Uh, you know, I yes. sent out an announcement today and I basically, I framed it as uh, staying in tuned in an entangled universe. And uh, yeah, there's, there's, I think a lot for us to sort through there. Um, so I was wondering if you wanted to give us basically, uh, you know, a, a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah. As, uh, as most of us are aware of, Pretty much everything involves relationships. Everything is relationships. There's ultimate truth, which is like one taste, and everything else is relative truth, and that's all relationships. And uh, um, I think that that's the more that I that I grow, and the more I learn, and the more I study, and the more I practice, and everything, the more deeply I understand that. Uh, and one level of relationships is the universe is entangled. Uh, every particle in the universe is entangled with other particles. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And this affects, this is completely practically relevant to us because the way that we enact relationships is through states. States of consciousness, if you think about it, is where we can observe the quadrants, lines, levels, and types. It's all enacted through states. And states practice is how we affect all that stuff. And those states are almost always relational states. Um, and, you know, December is a very social month where there's going to be an awful lot of relational uh, intricacies that happen. There's new people, there's family members, people that we haven't seen for a while. There's stresses on our family and so on. And that makes for great connections, which are mutually amplifying positive states, but also makes for distress connections, which are mutually amplifying negative states. And it's actually the nature of human uh, social programming that we tend to enter complementary states with each other. Um, and that's a big deal if you can, if you, in general, and it's, and it's very useful if you understand it in a way of what's my purpose in different kinds of social connections. And so in our intimate relationship, we want to have mutually amplifying positive states. In our relationships with all the different parts of ourselves, we want mutually amplified positive states. And we don't want to have interiorly uh, amplified negative states or interpersonally amplified negative states. And so how do we do that? Well, one way is to understand that on the, at the core of states practice um, is attunement. And attunement happens on multiple levels. And I was, and, and it happens not just on the level that we're doing now, face to face and my brain to brain via mirror neurons and resonance with my voice and your voice and everybody listening and so on. It's also happening via morphogenic fields. Um, it's also um, happening via bioluminescence. If you're in the same room with somebody, your bioluminescence becomes coherent with them and with any other living thing in the room. Um, and, and the, the connection that I wanted to talk a little bit about today it, it draws from the physics of Nassim Harimé, who is my current um, favorite living physicist. Nassim Harimé is an interesting guy. He was born in Switzerland, raised in Canada, and he dropped out of high school and became a professional skier and then a ski instructor. But he had a, a, one of those weird uh, mathematical physics brains. So he studied physics and, after, and did and math, and after a while became, be, 
began to come up with equations that explained um, phenomena that the standard model of physics has been unable to explain adequately. For instance, the wave particle um, uh, uh, quandary explained by Nassim Harimi. Nassim Harimi measured the circumference of a proton by, by balancing it against the mass of the universe. And uh, his mathematics uh, demonstrate that protons are little black holes. Um, those are just two great Nassim Harimi mm -hmm. examples. But another one that is relevant to today is he has an explanation for quantum entanglement. Now, for those of you that haven't heard about quantum entanglement, there's a series of experiments that have been done over the last 15 years where um, photons have been separated, um, particles have been separated and moved hundreds of miles away. And if you affect one photon, there's an instantaneous transmission uh, of information to the other one. Um, now this apparently violates Einstein's um, equations that says nothing can travel faster than light. But what if the information is not traveling? What if the information um, uh, is, uh, is being um, transmitted um, through another mechanism, another space-time mechanism? And what Nassim's equations have suggested is that that information is being translated through really tiny wormholes. And, and according to his work, all the protons and electrons in this universe are connected via little tiny wormholes. Not only that, um, they're connected in holarchies. And he doesn't use that, that, those terms. I don't know if he studied integral or not. But he describes these holarchies of um, uh, electrons, protons, atoms, molecules, and so on. And at every level, there's more coherence. And what, what happens at these levels of, of holarchy is they actually are antenna that are receiving and transmitting information and energy from the universe. The universe is filled with information and energy. Um, the most empty vacuum is filled with information and energy. And we are receiving and transmitting that information and energy, as is everything in the universe. Now, before life, uh, these, these processes were mediated by physics and chemistry. But with, with life came... Um, intention, prehension and intention and action. And so life can affect what kind of an antenna it is. Um, when there came a more complicated brain, what happened was focused attention, focused intention, attention and action, which is a further way of um, adjusting, attuning the um, antenna that is the, the consciousness. Um, uh, with uh, self-awareness and with social mechanisms came lower left um, quadrant principles. And now there's focus, intention, intention, and action in service of principle. And with upper left development, we developed uh, mental capacities to stay focused and to, over long periods of time, even years. And now we have focus, intention, and action in service of principle and driven by resolve, a human superpower. And we can use this human superpower to our personal antenna of our consciousness and the antenna of our inner subjectivity with other people. Um, and an optimal way of attuning the antenna that is our consciousness is being aware of and, and surrendering to giving and trans receiving and transmitting um, wisdom and love. So just for a moment, everybody out there and you, Corey, and me, let's just all assume that there's wisdom and love um, permeating the universe and coming through us and that we want to transmit wisdom and love, not just specifically to each other, but in general. And that if we can maintain that balance of receiving and transmitting, we can feel ourselves surrendering to both of those things, something happens. We begin to have a state experience. Um, so, for instance, Corey, as you do this, as you focus on um, receiving the wisdom and love of the universe and transmitting it out to me and to everybody, what do you feel in your body? What do you feel in your consciousness? Uh, warmth. Mm -hmm. um, I feel a, a 
a current that I'm participating with that doesn't necessarily belong to me in any way, but it's sort of coming through. Um, I feel, uh, I would say sort of the, um, the boundary that separates me from others feels a little bit more permeable, a little bit more porous, maybe a little bit more um, even fictional in a certain yeah. kind of way. I can see how much of that boundary is actually the result of a story that I tell myself um, and not so much sort of the natural state of affairs. Um, and I feel gratitude. That's what I feel when I do this. And you notice it's not just transmitting um, love and wisdom, though transmitting love and wisdom makes you healthier. Loving mm. kindness med meditation, you know, w w focusing on somebody else and wishing them, I, I, may you be healthy, may you be happy, may you have an easeful life, may, yeah. um, um, may you be safe. Um, when we do that, when we do loving kindness uh, meditation, um, anti-inflammatory genes are activated, um, antiviral genes are activated, inflammatory genes are deactivated. Um, our bodies respond to that attunement just when we put it out. But if we're not receiving it, if we don't have a sense of receiving love and wisdom, we feel we can feel isolated. Mm. Um, just like if we're receiving it, we're, we're, I'm, I'm receiving love and wisdom, but I'm not particularly experiencing myself transmitting it. Um, again, that's an isolating experience. I personally think this is probably one of the origins of Mahayana Buddhism. I mean, Mahayana Buddhism, with Mahayana Buddhism came not just emptiness practice, it came the Bodhisattva vow. And what is the Bodhisattva vow? Um, I don't need to focus on, on um, uh, I will not step off the wheel until everyone can step off the wheel. I have a responsibility not just to feel the love and wisdom of the universe and, and, and be one with it. I have responsibility to transmit it. Now, when two people are attuned to each other and they're receiving and transmitting love and wisdom, that creates deep contact. And deep contact is the gold standard of relationships. It opens the moment. All of us like it. It's mm. all wonderful. And that's great. Okay, you know, yeah. That's what a lot of state practice uh, does. It takes us one way or another into receiving and transmitting love and wisdom, being in that state and essentially adjusting the antenna that is us um, to the people around us in the local level. And, and according to Nassim on, on the, um, the universal level. But there's always counterbalancing forces. Um, mm. Now, the counterbalancing forces are if I feel a sense of threat inside me or from you, my nervous system instantiates an absorbing state. An absorbing state, uh, it was named after a chemist called Markov. This absorbing state is a defensive state. And that defensive state is amplified or numbed emotions, distorted perspectives and stories, destructive impulses and diminished capacities for empathy and self-reflection. Um, these defensive states are, are instantaneously um, uh, brought about by our unconscious. I, I call it, in general, that's my broad definition of shadow, to protect us. Um, and when one person does it, another person's nervous system instantiates a complementary defensive state instantaneously. Now, what that happens with two people, if they're not aware, is they have now, it's not mutually amplifying um, love and wisdom. They have mutually amplifying um, distress, anger, fear, that kind of stuff. And, you know, you mentioned the story earlier. Um, that distorted perspective, that's how human beings keep themselves in distressed states. They, that distorted perspective is a negative story about why I'm screwed up or why you're screwed up or why I'm right and you're wrong and, and that kind of stuff. And we will, we will unconsciously use our, con use our left hemisphere, use our capacity for thought to feed that defensive story, to strengthen it, to deepen it. And as we do that, we become more threatening to another person who does the same. Now we have an escalating conflict. Now, with couples that are characterized with escalating conflicts, if that's something that they typically do when there's a threat, they divorce on average after 5.6 years. Okay. So escalating conflict is particularly toxic in human relationships. Okay. Um, now, couples that don't mutually amplify positive, you know, love and wisdom 
points where we're feeling like we're getting in a deeper and deeper contact with each other, which is yummy, which can happen when we're playing. It doesn't happen with serious conversation. It can happen when we're laughing. It can happen when we're sharing something, that kind of stuff. You know, couples that don't do that, they are kind of neutral and, 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 and with each other and don't, don't mutually amplify positives, they tend to divorce after 16.2 years. Mm. So, so if we want to be happy, a happy couple, we need to be able to de-escalate those negative states, those defensive states, and, and upregulate those positive states. Um, and I, I believe that there is a line of development. Uh, I call it the integration of defenses line of development, an awkward term. I should come up with a better term, where we get better and better at noticing ourselves going into defensive states and then regulating them into states of attunement. And those states of attunement are, are a variation of giving and receiving love and wisdom um, with ourselves and with other people. And if we're doing that with someone who's in a defensive state with us, we're not just resisting our own defensive state. We're using compassionate understanding to deconstruct our negative story. And then we're either relating with this person if they're able to regulate or we're handling them if they're not. Um, now, this is very important coming with the holidays because we're going to have a lot of social situations, everybody. <laughs> and, and we have responsibilities in those social situations. Integral people tend to have pretty deep consciousness, has been my experience. And the person with the deepest consciousness in the room has the most responsibility. <laughs> and so you have responsibility to be attuning yourself and the room towards the giving and receiving uh, love and wisdom. And you can do that by relating or you can do it by handling. Um, but that's our responsibility. And we also have a responsibility to get deeper and deeper on the integration of defenses line, to notice those defensive states and to regulate out of them quickly. Now, as you do that, you begin to notice certain things. One thing is it's very hard to maintain a state of, uh, of uh, moral disgust or contempt. It, it's hard to maintain a state of um, punitive anger. It's hard to maintain a state of um, angry di disconnection. As you do that, you, 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 you've, you've grown your interior moral system, your lower left, so that actually feels immoral to do that. And so now what do I do? Well, I need to find a way to attune back to giving and receiving love and wisdom. And then if I'm in a social situation, to take a stand um, for opening this moment rather than closing it. And this comes from states practice. Uh, and this is using states practice. This is how we grow on lines and levels. This is how we become healthier versions of our types. Um, this is how we optimize our physical, psychological, and emotional health and social health, body, mind, spirit, and self-culture and nature. This is how we optimize our health and our contribution on all four quadrants. And uh, to me, the, this hook, you know, we're always looking for hooks. You know, we always want an easy way to make a state shift. Pretty much all contemplative practices, everything, all the work, all psychotherapy, on and on and on, neurofeedback, medication and you know we, we we've had conversations about medication some of it really good some of it horrible mm -hmm. all of it is like adjusting states okay? you know and it's hard to adjust states because states have momentum we have habitual states and and evolution is not fair some of us are born happier or sadder or more crabby or less crabby that kind of stuff but you know self-aware consciousness has that superpower focused intent and action and service principle and driven by resolve and if we can stay attuned to giving and receiving love and wisdom it's one way of of organizing ourselves to open the moment if we can notice that defensive state and then use compassionate understanding to deconstruct it then we can focus on our responsibility with our partner and our responsibilities with our partners are to be lovable and help our partners be lovable now, when I say this to a couple, um, they go, okay, that sounds good. And so then they're later on, like he's contemptuously putting down how, you know, she did what. And they go, so let me see, how is your contempt making you more lovable and helping her be more lovable? You know, just explain that to me. Or she's explaining to him, you know, what an idiot it is, how he's wrong. And she's, he's probably on the autism spectrum because he doesn't know how to feel his emotions. And I go, you know, how is, you know, explaining to him about how fucked up he is, how is that making you more lovable and helping him be more lovable? I mean, you know, like, help me out here. And usually they'll laugh and they go, it's not. And then we'll go in another direction. And so 
we have responsibility when we're around other people to do this, I think. Why not? That's the 10th ox cart picture, which I'm fond of referencing all the time. You know, he was walking around the village and everywhere he goes, people are left enlivened. Well, that guy's antenna of consciousness is attuned to giving and receiving the love and wisdom of the universe. You know, he's maintaining that. And I actually think that that's what happens if we do an awful lot of contemplative work. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, you know, the neuroscience of that is quite persuasive. I think that that, that um, has been borne out in a lot of ways. And is it driven by these, these, these whole archies of, of wormholes? Um, you know, and the same things we're con always connected to the universe. And certainly the Buddhists believe that the universe is all connected and entangled. And the beautiful thing about um, the entanglement is that it's simultaneous. You know, so we're not limited by speed of light and that kind of stuff. That wherever consciousness is in, in the universe, we're connected to it right now. Yeah. And I want to contribute to that in a positive way. I don't want to contribute in a negative way. Right. And of course, here, so there, go on. of course, here, you know, having having sort of a, an integral conversation, we want to be a little bit careful around things like quantum physics, because there's often a temptation to try to use things like quantum physics to begin to explain sort of this black box of consciousness. We, in other words, we have this human consciousness, which is way up here, sort of at the, at the cutting edge of evolution uh, in this corner of the cosmos. And we're trying to find ways to explain that consciousness by looking at the, you know, the basement floor basically of, of reality and seeing if we can, you know, we can't seem to point to consciousness anywhere else. So it must be way down there on the quantum level. And, you know, I think a lot of those, those efforts uh, tend to be misguided, plus the fact that we're looking for a sort of a third person data driven way to explain our own first person subjectivity. And, you know, it's almost, you know, like Ken says, it, there's a difference between sitting on a cushion every day for 20 years and experiencing Satori and opening up and waking up and all of that versus memorizing a bunch of mathematical equations that, you know, describe some facet of the universe and how it works. I, now, I, I say all this just to sort of explicate it. I don't think you're saying any of any of that at all. I think you're treading that line carefully. It sounds to me like what you're saying yeah. is that this capacity to to just to simply relate with each other is a is a holonic capacity that has been there from the very beginning of the universe. In other words, this entanglement um, that exists on the quantum level is is not the is not a way to explain consciousness and relationship and love and you know sort of all these again very high level kind of manifestations of consciousness, but it's to say that this is this is the substrate of the universe itself, and it's a capacity that sort of recapitulates itself from holonic level to holonic level to holonic level. Do you think that's that's fair to say? Absolutely. Um, the Here's what's exciting about this to me. I've basically been explaining. Nassim's basically talking about a right, right um, quadrant um, explanations for an awful lot of physics, physical phenomena. But you know, if you look at, at Ken's map of the quadrants, you know how when it goes out, you know you're going, you know, on the upper left, you're going to, you know, more and more subtle realms. Uh, well, as you go to more and more subtle realms, I think that you have access through intentionality to more and more subtle realms on the right quadrant too, the upper right and the lower right. Um, and, 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 and so I think that as, as it expands, and, and, the, and the lower left too, mm -hmm. and there's lots of evidence of that, uh, that, that as, we, as we develop our, as we progress, if we're, if we're progressing on, very, on more than one line, we develop some more and more and more subtle discernments and capacities to direct attention Mm -hmm. and amplify states. Um, now, when it comes to, when we're talking about, uh, you know, I'm pretty okay phenomenologically up to tur turquoise. Going up to violet, um, you know, I, I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> you know, I just really don't. I mean, I, there's certainly experiences that I've had in ultraviolet, um, but there's something. Now, I don't know what it is, um, I completely don't think that it's reducible to anything, frankly. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm enthusiastic, whatever it is, I'm pretty enthusiastic about it and want to contribute in a positive way to it. Yeah. Okay? That's, that's my own sense. So, no, I'm not trying to reduce consciousness. But I am saying that as consciousness expands, um, 
there is a, actually probably more power of attuning the antenna of our consciousness um, to have more of a contribution, to, mm -hmm. to give and receive more love and wisdom in general in the universe, in an entangled universe, but specifically in relationships. Mm. Rel and not just with other people, but with ourselves. Um, the, it's, it's interesting to me, that, uh, again and again, I see this, um, that, that, our, that, uh, that our programming, the instincts of our programming give us these problems to solve of anxiety and depression and, and desire and, and, and uh, you know, lust and moral conflicts and all that kind of stuff that are like Cohen's. You know, that, that as we address them with open hearts and receive, giving and receiving loving influence, um, um, we can, can wake up. We can wake mm -hmm. up to new understandings. We can wake up to a, a, a deeper sense of love and wisdom. And, and it's, a good, it's good to have a purpose. You know, when I walk into a room, part of my purpose is I want to open, I want to open up the room. I want to be, I want to receive and transmit love and wisdom, whether it's listening to somebody's story or telling somebody a story or attuning to a person or noticing my own defensive um, reflexes and then regulating them. Um, my purpose is to serve this, this moment, to serve mm -hmm. this group or to serve this person. Um, now, I'm a, I'm a purpose-driven person, so that really helps me. To someone who, who isn't a particularly purpose-driven purpose person, that might not be a useful uh, construct. Though we're all relationally driven. And so the idea of always taking a stand for relating better, you know, attuning more to giving and transmitting love and wisdom rather than less, I think that probably appeals to everybody. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, well, very well said. Um, and, know, and, one other, and one other comment. The stories that we tell each other to stay, ourselves to stay in those distressed states, those stories will vary according to our value meet. Right. So, you know, like red people telling themselves red stories about, you know, why these people aren't in it, aren't taking care of me, you know. The, 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 the amber people tell themselves amber stories. This person isn't, ser isn't serving the sacred text. The orange people will tell orange stories. This person's a loser or something. The green people will tell green stories. But in defensive states, it's always defensive states. So a defensive state by any other name is still a defensive state. The difference in worldview is that as people progress in worldviews, they have more capacities for self-observation, right. more capacities for wider embrace to bring the bear to regulate those states. And I just wanted to, to point that out. Yeah, no, it, it factors into the next point I was going to raise, you know, again, talking about these sort of different cosmographies and how they actually impact our emotional and mental well-being. Um, yeah. And I think that what you're talking about with this sort of, you know, the opportunities a lot of this, these sort of new physics conversations offer us isn't, you know, we already covered, like, you don't want to, you don't want to, um, you know, go searching for consciousness in a place where, you know, you're, you're obviously not going to find it. Um, That's right. but, but I think, you know, a couple of months ago, Keith, you and I did a conversation about, um, the 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 power of a positive interpretive framework oh yeah leverage that can that can actually give us in our own sort of ongoing uh growing up and waking up process and i think that a big part of that actually is sort of our inherited you know sense of cosmology um you know it's one thing to come from an amber cosmology where you know for example in in the christian world everything is is you know created by god and you are uh, ultimately one with God. And that brings its own sort of hermeneutic with it. And it, it brings its own uh, interpretive framework that is going to, uh, you know, shape our values and our morals and our views and our sense of right versus wrong and our ability to communicate and our ability to um, overcome obstacles. You know, all of that um, so uh, kind of exists on this bedrock of, of basic uh, cosmological worldview. And then when yeah. we hit orange, you know, when we get the, the modern scientific worldview, which for, you know, a good couple hundred years, the prevailing kind of metaphor was, you know, we're all just impersonal billiard balls, just bouncing yeah, right, off right. each other. And, you know, and there's, there's no, there's no interiority there. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a cold agentic universe. And that's Flatland. all it is. And, you know, I don't think it's any accident that any number of, of, you know, neuroses and anxieties and so forth have, have emerged within the space of that, 
of that cosmology. Now it's not to say, you know, correlation is causation or anything like that, but it, you know, it feels like there's, there's a relationship there. And now there, I think there is because we don't have mythic membership to bind us together. There's more social isolation. That's right. You know, orange, orange is an individual. I know Ken disagrees a little bit that, you know, that you shift individual and, and communitarian value memes, but it seems to me that orange is a more individualistic value meme. Yeah. That it's easier to be isolated. Green is, is more a little bit more it seems more communitarian and amber seems more communitarian. Yeah, I think Ken agrees with that. Yeah. I think okay. he sees yeah, orange as being one of the more agentic. He's he see, you know, I, I I think what Ken would say is it's not necessarily true on an individual level, like as yeah, I, I agree with that. Growth, but as as we collectively move through these, which, which makes a lot of sense because you know, we kind of the pendulum swings, right? And and um, you know, sort of the, the communal issues created by Amber are addressed by the, you know, sort of agentic impulses of orange, which creates its own issues, which is then sort of redressed by communal green. And that's kind of how well, in relationships, in relationships out of orange, I think to a certain extent out of pathological orange comes the concept of the consumer marriage mm. where, you know, like my partner is there to satisfy my needs, you know, it's like, kind of like my dentist. So, so my partner satisfying my needs. Okay, that's working. But say my partner stops satisfying my needs. Well, you know, my dentist isn't doing a great job on my teeth. I'll get another dentist. You know, my <laughs> partner satisfying my needs. I'll get another partner. Right. You know, you know that's that kind of works for in, in more in an orange worldview than it does certainly in an amber or green worldview. Um, and I think that's you know. We, with every with every step upward, there's more room for there's there's new pathologies that arise, and so yep. the pathology of the consumer marriage is one that I think showed up with with orange and and now, now you notice I obviously have a lower left quadrant moral disgust for that concept. <laughs> now <laughs> that being said, I think that we do have responsibility to be lovable and to help our partner be lovable. Totally. Yes. That's, that's why Chapman's book on the five love languages was such an amazing bestseller because b embedded in that book was way we all like to be loved in certain ways and our partner likes to be loved in certain ways. And maybe we should do more of that. I mean, that, that concept was persuasive enough to keep that book on the bestseller list for right. I don't know how many. Right. Well, and, and also, you know, even alongside that, it's, you know, it's not like we're saying that it's, it's if, if you get angry, you're doing something wrong. If you feel resentment, you're doing something wrong. If you feel you know, any of these impulses, they're not, they're not positive or negative impulses in and of themselves. It's how we engage with them. Right. I mean, a big part of this is, is it's okay to feel these states. It starts becoming somewhat less okay when we get stuck in these states, when we don't, when we're unable to find the, the expansion within our own consciousness that says, Hey, wait, wait a minute here my consciousness is bigger than this state that I'm experiencing right now. Because when you're, when you, get, you do get sort of trapped in these things, that's exactly what it feels like. It feels like this feeling stretches out to the boundaries of my consciousness itself, right? There's nothing other than what I'm feeling right now. It's absorbing. You're yeah. absorbed. You know, uh, John Gottman calls absorbing negative states roach motels. Mm -hmm. They're easy to get in and hard to get out. You know, like that was that was, a roach motel was the way people killed roaches. You know, they, they attracted them with pheromones into this thing and they died. In it. Um, that actually happens. Uh, now we can tr using states practice. We can do two things. One, we can develop the witness. So if I'm if I'm witnessing myself entering a, a defensive state, I am an order of magnitude less threatening to my partner. Right. Because I don't go, fuck you. I go, God, I'm in, I'm in that, that, I'm in that fuck you state. You know, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, my partner can actually be supportive of that. Okay. So that capacity for the witness that you get from contemplative practice, that gives you that, that room to then make that observation, but making that observation isn't enough. Right. If, okay. This isn't a good state. Right. This is what I the point I made in my book, Integral Mindfulness, again and again and again, you know, from clueless to dial in. Um, OK, but now what do I do? OK, well, there are a variety of things to do other than indulge the defensive state. One is you deconstruct the, the distorted perspective, the hostile story with compassionate understanding. 
you know, you, you reach for um, uh, imp- empathy and self-reflection. You know, you reach for attunement. If, you know, I've, I've been practicing this thing of, of feeling myself giving and receiving love and wisdom as just as a practice. I mean, I'm like most integral people. I love practices and done a bunch of them and do a bunch of them. And I've added this one and, and have been enjoying it immensely. Okay, well, that helps. Um, if I'm with my partner and I know that my job is to either relate with them out of their defensive state or to handle them in some fashion until they're able, able to, okay, well, then that gives me direction around what to do. Okay, so one, we want to be able to observe ourselves, but two, we do want to have uh, principles. Mm-hmm. You know, the principle here is a defensive state is a bad state to, to let yourself hang out in. It's, uh, it, they become absorbing states where people will spend a lot of their time in them. And that's really bad for your health, bad for your relationships and so on. What I teach people all day long is when you enter that state, you need to regulate yourself out of it and help your partner regulate themselves out of it until you feel warm towards each other, until you're more lovable and you help your partner be more lovable. Um, and, and especially under stress. So that's one more reason for having this conversation uh, in December, because there's going to be a lot of social events happening next month and a lot of stress, positive and negative, any kind of change is stressful. And it's good to know what we're about during those stressful. I'm about um, keeping myself attuned and opening the moment um, right. uh, by, by taking a stand for positive reciprocating self-amplifying states. Um, getting out. In other words, we want to. We want the, the Roach Motel to be hard to get into and easy to get out of. We want to <laughs> turn that around. Right. And we can. We can with practice yeah. and with help by receiving yeah. influence from each other. And it requires choice, right? I mean, this is this is an act of volition. You're actually choosing your way uh, to more fulfillment, to more happiness. Um, but it, it's not something that uh, you know you can sit in a cushion every day. And until you make that choice, um, it, you know, you're, 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 you're just going to be swimming in it still. And well, I, I, that's I, our superpower. Right. That, that's a super. And, you know, we, uh, we learn things and we enact things in patterns. And it's very hard to learn a new pattern. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you want to learn a new pattern in a relationship, generally, ultimately, you're going to have to be in a relationship and enact new patterns. You know, so occasionally if somebody says, you know, I don't want to have any relationships for, you know, six months to a year. And I go, okay, that sounds okay. Or they go, you know, to work through my relational stuff, I have to leave this particular person. Well, if that particular person isn't willing to participate in, you know, creating new patterns. I understand that. But if that person's willing to participate in creating new patterns, leaving that person isn't going to help you be different. Leaving that person is just an, uh, a, a new iteration of the same pattern of getting right. connected and leaving when you're distressed. If you want to change the pattern, stay in a relationship, endure the distress of that, and find a way back to love. If you do that, that's a new pattern. It's really hard the first time, and then it's hard the second time, and then it's a little less hard the third time, and then it's a little less hard the fourth time. And after the 50th or 60th time, it's the easiest thing to do. Right. That's what we want. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's waking up and that's waking up to love and waking up to love is what I'm all about. <laughs> waking up in second person. Waking up in second person. I love it. So are there any questions or comments anybody wants to make? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, uh, let's talk about how you submit them. So if you are watching on integrallife.com slash live, there should be a link right underneath the player that'll bring you into the zoom app and you can ask your questions there. Uh, if you're already in the Zoom app, you can either raise your hand, which tells us you've got a question you want us to turn your camera on so you can ask it directly, uh, or you can hit the Q&A button and you can, you can write a, uh, you can submit a written question that we'll read and, and respond to. Um, and while we wait to see if there's, you know, any questions, Keith, one observation I have is, um, you know, I think it's really cool that we're starting to see more of these mindfulness type approaches saturating our culture. Um, uh-huh. You know, it, I'm seeing, I'm starting to see a lot more conversations like these. And I'm, I'm appreciative for this conversation in particular because I'm the type of person, you know, we've talked about this before. I'm the type of person who, you know, a few times a year, I kind of, I fall through a hole in the floor and I, you know, I, I go into this depressive cycle that can be really challenging to to 
pull myself out of, um, you know, regardless of whatever experience I have with mindfulness and, you know, interpretive frameworks I have through having conversations like these still, it's a challenge every time it happens. And so I'm actually reading a book right now, uh, The Happiness Trap, and I've only just begun to read this book. But, you know, he here again is basically a mindfulness based practice, which is stripped of all its sort of, you know, spiritual symbolism and, 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 and all of that and presented in a very, you know, sort of it, it's, it's presented as a as a as a type of wellness, not a type of necessarily enlightenment or anything like that. And I think that's cool. I think that's actually important that we that we allow more of these uh, uh, interpretations of these approaches and methodologies that don't trigger people's, you know, I don't know, concerns about different spiritual traditions or new ways that are understandable and accept acceptable to, to different value memes. That's right. That's you know, right. being healthier is something that, that red, amber, orange, uh, green, teal, turquoise, everybody agrees healthier is better than less healthy. It's a yeah. good orienting principle. Yep. And it's a great book for anyone who also struggles with these types of things and has a hard time again, finding that, the expansion of consciousness beyond the state that you're kind of trapped in right now. It's, it's a really cool book. It's got a lot of really great uh, practical advice and practices to, um, to help, you know, shift your seat a little bit when you're, when you're dealing with those kinds of challenges. Uh, so we have a question from Shayla, Wright. Shayla, I'm going to bring you on. Let's see here. There we go. Let's unmute you. Hi, Shayla. Hi, Keith. Hey, Shayla. Hi. Good to see you. Good to, Good to you. see you again. Yeah. I have a question about, it feels to me like there's this paradox right at the heart of everything we're exploring right now. Mm -hmm. And it's about the fact that I can't really transform any state or any experience if I'm not willing to fully presence it with every... Mm -hmm single part of me mm -hmm. and that that for me in, in my work that's one of the you know I, I begin my practice because I want to evolve and I want to heal and I want to transform these things but the part of me that wants to get away from them make them better is often the part that's obstructing what is actually the medicine that's needed mm -hmm. yes so I notice when I hear you say things like you know a defensive state is a bad state and I don't want to stay there on one level. That's totally true. But I find if I, if I hold that in the wrong way, it causes more defensiveness. More yes. Control, right. Yes. Good. Um, that is, a, and it, here's the paradox and, and you put your finger on it. This is, this is great. Um, uh, the instincts, the drives that we have are all counter, uh, for every drive, there's a counter, a counter force. For every, the force of a driver instinct, there's a counter force. In other words, in our drive to affiliate, there's also a, a drive um, to be separate. Yeah. In, our, uh, in, in our drive um, um, uh, to be monogamous, there's also a drive to be polygamous. Yeah. Um, so th th there's always these counterbalancing forces. And it's the observing ego that, that makes the decision about what to do with, this, with, with them. And so if we take a stand, consciously or unconsciously, that a particular experience is unacceptable to us, we'll amplify that experience. That's, we'll, that's we'll, a great way of putting it. Thank you. We'll anchor it down. And, and, yeah. and OK, that's an unacceptable experience. OK, well, now, now I've, what I've done is I've allowed that experience now to colonize my consciousness. Yeah. Okay, now, because it's included in transcend, right? Yeah. And so th the first thing always with the defensive state is, yeah, I'm in a defensive state. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, I want to fight or flight. Yeah. yeah. You know, now yeah. that, that level of acceptance is a lower left experience. You know, remember the moral sense is always about whether we're finding ourselves virtuous or not. And part of the reason that we say, I don't, I want to push against this state is not just because it's painful, because it's bad. Okay. And so what if it's not bad? What if it's just painful? You know, what, you know, anxiety is, is painful, but it, 
It's just anxiety. Depression is painful, just depression. Yeah. Right? Shame, painful. Okay, even though shame is a social emotion that I'm generated when I feel like I've done something wrong. If I can examine the experience phenomenologically as you're describing, that's the first step towards integrating it. And integration is pleasurable. So this is so now we're getting a reciprocal inhibitory effects. You know, as I accept an experience and I have compassion and understanding, that creates a subjective sense of insight. Insight creates these little bubbles of dopamine in our brain. It's pleasurable. And now we're changing in our state. But it has to start, as you said, with acceptance. You know, that, that one of the keys to happiness, going back to the happiness trap, is to expect everything and accept everything as it is at this present moment, which in, includes the defensive state. Now, for me, I accept that I'm in a defensive state, but I begin to do the work of deconstructing it immediately. Yes. Um, yes. Now, now, and also, it's immoral for me to indulge a defensive state. That's right. That's you know, right. I, I, have a more, I have a lower left standard. It's, like just, it's immoral for me to do violence to other people um, emotionally or physically. Um, and so if I find myself doing it, I'll appropriately feel a shame emotion. But again, if I can accept that, what am I, oh, I'm being violent, change that. Okay. You know, it's a, that's such an interesting point that I can, as soon as I have fully presenced the state with, you know, with an embodied presence, Mm -hmm. I, can, I can begin to work to deconstruct it. Mm -hmm. And I think when that doesn't happen and the, um, the indulgence, that, that's a lack of usually full acceptance also. I that's agree. That's paradox, right? Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, it's the, you know, uh, the, the, the part of it that, and here's where ego comes in. You know, in my own personal therapy, um, I, what I run into is I'll just run into situations where I'm just unwilling to let go of, you know, attachment or my control or something, you know, and that's where I'll have my problems. And, you know, I go to that state. I try to be accepting of Keith doing that. And gradually over the years, it expands, but, you know, it shows up. And I think this is why people get pissed off at their ego because, you know, it changes so slowly, you know, you <laughs> tend to get really mad at it. But, but as, as we were saying earlier, that just makes it, you know, more concrete. Got to go, okay, this is, this is changing slowly here. Okay, now when I'm accepting it changing slowly, paradoxically, what does it do? Changes faster. Yeah, a lot yeah. faster. Yeah, the word I often use is glacial. Yeah, glacial. I use that word a lot too. Though, though these days, these days that doesn't mean what it used to mean. No, that's all the glacials are just melting so fast. That's a good point. I need to remember that. Yeah, yeah. Thank and you very much. I just want to also um, acknowledge okay. when I interacted with you last year, sometime mm -hmm. you were talking about the the chaos and turbulence that's going on in the country and how it's affecting our children. Mm -hmm. And I asked you how you deal with that kind of heartbreak. And you said to me, I feel it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I cry a lot. And that was so beautiful to hear that uh, from you. And it stayed with me for a long time. Well, thank you. And That's beautiful. Still feel that. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, thanks for, thanks for coming on today. You know, come on again. You know, I be will. on the next one. Good. It's a great pleasure. Thank All right. You. Thank you, thank Shayla. You. Bye-bye, Sheila. All right. So let's see if uh, anyone has any other questions. There was one Q&A question that came in, Keith, just wondering what the name of the book was that I had mentioned, uh, which, again, was The Happiness Trap, um, which I find very, very useful. And a lot of that, you know, there's a lot of this material, uh, again, that I found recapitulated in the book where it's talking about, you know, when we're experiencing something that we would qualify as a negative state, our first impulse is usually, I need to do whatever I can to get rid of the state, to push yeah, it away it. or to avoid right, right. it or to, you know, or, you know, you guys use the word deconstruct. And none, all of that just makes it worse. You know, it's, it's sort of like the old metaphor I've heard for meditation, which is, you know, if you're sitting by, um, you know, if you're sitting next to a stream and it's a muddy stream and you want that mud to, to settle down, you kind of just have to accept it and wait. The more you actually use your hands to try to push the mud to the bottom of the stream, the more dirty and cloudy everything actually becomes. And that's in a lot of ways how I've learned how to relate with my own 
anxiety. A lot of the a lot of the sort of knee jerk strategies that I had for managing anxiety would only make that anxiety insufferably worse um, because they were all short term tactics that were based on a rejection of the feeling and not actually on a full acceptance that like oh anxiety's here oh this is uncomfortable as fuck you know. Uh, I, I better make some space for this right now so that it can come and it can pass when I don't make the space for it, it, it lingers. And I, and, and, you know, I get stuck there. Accepting what is, is the first step. And then what's the next step with a couple we're mad at each other. Um, so, okay, let's accept that. I, I, you know, Becky and I had a, had a, like a five minute fight pretty, it was pretty hot but it was like five or ten minutes and it's been very useful because i've been referring to it in my work you know the last two or three weeks one guy looked at me he said did you really have a fight i said no I, yes you know i don't i don't like make stuff up <laughs> i kind of have a tick about being honest and i i was so struck when i was in that fight i was going boy i the last thing in the world that i want to do is acknowledge that i'm distorted and that what i really need to do is is focus on validating you until i feel better about you um i knew that was what i needed to do you know that's a form of integral mindfulness mm -hmm. you know i was aware of what was happening i was accepting it but also i knew where i wanted to go with it so wanting to go wasn't denying the distress but it was reaching for what was on the other side of that or what was through it which meant you know, understanding it, tolerating it, and then going, going, okay, now let's go deeper. Now, when you do that, pain changes. That's actually one of the, the, the more effective current forms of pain management. Yeah. Um, that you be aware of the pain, physical pain in this case, uh, or even psychological pain, you, could, you can do it with. Find a part of your body where it's hurting you know, really feel it in that part, you know, with emotional pain often in your torso and then go, well, what part of your body is not feeling depressed or anxious? Well, my, le my left foot isn't feeling okay. So now you go to your left foot, not feeling depressed and anxious and you go to your heart feeling depressed. That pendulating process, when you do it, eases the pain. Mm. Right? Partly through acceptance, but partly through, I think the experience of uh, focused intent and, you know, in service of principle, um, you're guiding yourself into an include and transcend moment. Um, and sometimes you'll have to tolerate it, um, particularly this time of year when it gets dark. You know, we're yeah. programmed. We're programmed to go into more emotional distress. There's a reason why there's a lot of social stuff around this time. People want to cluster together. It's not just because it's cold. You know, that absence of light um, has effects on a lot of us. Mm -hmm. um, my son, my son has the he he has the the full spectrum lights that you sit in in front of in, in morning and evening if you see, have seasonal affective issues, and it helps. But he still feels a, a lot of it, particularly now. This is the darkest month right now, and you know during the dark time um, uh, when we have emotional issues, um, uh, I, often they can get amplified. Yeah, it's just good to be aware of that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, it looks like we have another question from Pat Proano. Uh, let's bring you on. I've been noticing Pat's been kind of, uh, whoops, let me undo that, disable talking. Let's bring you over. He's been kind of popping on and off the chat. So I'm not sure if there's maybe a, a weak connection, but let's see what we can do. Hi, Pat. Oh, unmute. There we go. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear hey, you. Pat. Hi. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for all you do, by the way. I'm really enjoying Integral Life, kind of following you guys. Um, super interesting uh, talk today, and it kind of brings me back to um, work and uh, something, a practice that, uh, that I recall when you're walking into a room, if you walk with your right foot in mm -hmm. to remind you that you're bringing an energy into a situation, mm -hmm. and then to, um, on the witness side, is to quickly reflect on what is needed from you in that given situation mm -hmm. you know and that uh that always used to help me uh, it, it's super hard i mean because this whole thing about frequencies and connecting with people is uh it, you know it kind of re reminds me of a cat when a cat walks into a room they either feel the love the good frequency or don't feel the love and just or they don't away. feel the love yeah <laughs> 
Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I think I think there's a uh, this antennas and the frequencies that we have as human beings is something that has not quite uh, developed as much as we'd like it to, huh? You know, when I ask I asked Ken about an experience I had when I meditated once. Um, I was meditating and encountered an avatar uh, that w- that was turned out to be pretty stable for me, a Krishna avatar. And I said, well, what do you do with that? And Ken says, well, in the traditions, one of the things that you do is you create a mudra. A mudra is a physical posture that evokes a certain state. And you're describing that when you step into a room with your right foot, with um, the right intentionality. Body therapists have been doing this for decades. They teach people how to breathe into their belly and stand straight um, and look people in the eye. Now, th- these are, are socially effective, but they're also mudras. They, they are also are, are physical postures that then help us enter a more optimal state and remind us about what we're about. Um, I, you know, if you're a teacher, you know that there's times when you need to be a student and times where you need to be a teacher. If you're a performer, there's times when you're in the audience and times when you're on stage. And so you want to fully surrender to being the best student you can be when you're a student, be the best person delivering when you're on stage. And there are mudras for both of those. And that's what you're describing. And I think that's quite effective. And I encourage people to practice you know, what Ed's saying and, and try it yourself. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, oh, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. What I really like about Pat's um, suggestion. Thank you, is- Pat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what I really like about Pat's suggestion there is, is it's a micro practice. And for a yeah. lot of us, these micro practices are actually a more effective way to stay attuned than, for example, trying to drop this major, you know, you need to meditate for 40 minutes a day, twice a day. And it can be hard to commit to some of these, you know, enormous gestalts being dropped in our heads. Whereas Hardly anybody can do that. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Um, but I think that, that, you know, taking these little tiny efforts, which don't require much other than simply remembering to do it, um, can have a really, really profoundly meaningful effect on uh, changing our habits and changing our, our basic outlook, um, changing our, our, you know, essential view of who we are and, and who we're engaging with at any given moment. So I think that's, that's really cool. I really agree with that. I, I first discovered that when I studied Shotokan Karate. I was, I, I was puzzled as a teenager why I felt um, so confident when I was in the form. You know, I was in the outfit, I was in the form, and I was in the posture. And I didn't necessarily elsewhere. And I had similar experiences when I learned different yogas, um, you know, in the next 15 years. Um, and... Uh, more and more and more, when you talk to, when you hear people like us talk, or you 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 listen to spiritual teachers, um, or change agents of any sort, more and more and more, you're hearing exactly what you just said. Um, here's what you can do when you're driving your car. Here's what you can do when you're seeing somebody for the first time. Here's what you can do when you're confused. Here's a, a position, a way of breathing. Here's a way you can be in your body. Here's a way that you can direct your consciousness. Here's a, a gratitude that you can um, cultivate. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I personally love that. You know, that's very, that's very Tibetan Buddhist. Yeah. You, Tibetan Buddhists have these things that they do. You know, here's, here's the cup of tea. The God in the cup of tea is going into the God in me. And now we're joining. So they do that when they drink a cup of tea. So, you know, I don't do that when I drink a cup of tea every time, but I do sometimes. Um, when I remember. I encourage, yeah, when I remember. I encourage everybody to do stuff like that. Um, do the ones that you like. Uh, like, I really like this one about feeling that I'm an antenna that's giving and receiving love and wisdom from the universe. That's, that's, a, that's something that I've just been doing all the time for the, for the last uh, week or two, and I've been enjoying it immensely. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's provocative to me in a good way, yeah. um, causing me to go into, into new places in some of my other contemplative practices. Beautiful. Well, well? hey, man, <laughs> as always, I'm, I'm, 
I'm feeling better, more uplifted leaving this conversation than I did when I walked into it. So, you know, thank me you. Me too. Yeah, <laughs> thank these, you. These are always so great, man. Um, we have a lot of fun here. Uh, and yeah, for everyone watching, we're going to do another one of these next month. Uh, I don't have a calendar in front of me, so I can't tell you exactly what day, but we do the first Saturday of the month. Um, and I hope you guys will join us again for another episode of Wit and Wisdom. In the meantime, I'm Corey DeVos. Dr. Keith Witt, thank you so much, man. Much love to everybody. Thank you for joining us. And, and by the way, if it's a month later or two months later when you're listening to this, well, the quantum universe is atemporal. So, <laughs> so you can receive my love at this moment from, from you know, the past to the present moment. Take care, everybody. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>